Greetings, this is the going to be the first um, video in a series. Now moving on to another product by Carrie Anderson um, <coughs> called MacArthur's War, Korean War and Beyond. Um, it is a Korean War game, but if you watched my NATO 61 uh, or 1961 series, you did see that that game uh, moves beyond your traditional conventional battle like a lot of games. They just mainly focus on the conventional battle in Europe and uh, if you watch that video series you can see that it can escalate to theater nuclear weapons, escalate to strategic nuclear weapons and in my playthrough we did have a uh, Armageddon outcome. Um, MacArthur's War also gives that flexibility. That's why you see MacArthur here. And from history, it is known that uh, when the Communist Chinese did flood across the border and push the UN forces back, MacArthur asked for the ability to attack mainland China and even use nuclear weapons. So this game does allow that escalation and beyond, similar to what NATO 1961 did, uh, but different. And um, there are no ICBMs at this point. Uh, this is 1950, and uh, we're not really going to see global thermonuclear warhead, thermal nuclear warfare like we did in NATO 1961. So I'm going to use this recording as an opportunity to just kind of briefly go through the rules, uh, games. Uh, uh, this is, again, a learning one for me, too. So uh, as I go through this time, we're going to kind of just skim the rules. I'll make some comments, and then in the following videos, we will uh, play the play the game out and see where we end up, um, including that escalation capability. So here we go: MacArthur's War, uh, introduction, simulation cover war, covering the historical campaign. You'll see it's not it's not a large map of Korea. So you can see, in some sense, the priority of the game isn't just focused on the conventional battle here. Although it will be fought, unlike other games that really focus on that. Um, it's the escalation side that we're looking at, too. Uh, and here it goes, allowing for what could have happened if MacArthur had been given the go-ahead to launch his attacks on mainland communist China. Uh, the player role is Douglas MacArthur. So you're not really like Truman. You're not, you don't have the ability to just decide to do stuff when we see in the escalation. You actually have to make a roll. You request escalation, and there's some penalties if you fail it. And if you fail it twice, you're fired, which is actually what happened to MacArthur in real life. Um, and then on the Chinese side, the Chinese general staff, and then we're going to see how we manage that. Uh, you do see the components. This is the board, and actually to show this, we do have a we have a somewhat more involved area of China. And look, there is actually a chance um, for Soviet intervention too. Um, these are at-start forces that aren't going to really be doing anything for the Communist Chinese and the USSR, but you'll see through the escalation there is a possibility for them to come in to play. Uh, most of the units are divisions. All of the units seem to be divisions. There's a few brigades out there. <coughs> um, working down here, game scale, 53 clicks, kilometers from side to side. Combats, brigades, and division. Each turn is one month. Okay. There is no set end to the game, kind of like NATO 61. If you keep, I mean, you can keep going. Uh, one, the historical scenario starts in June. There's another scenario that starts in, I believe it's November, when the Chinese begin their attack. Uh, and there is a uh, tracking of atomic bombs at this point. Okay, it's just atomic bombs. Uh, U.S. starts with 300 of them. Uh, the communist player roll two dice, multiply, and that's secretly how many they have. So atomic bombs, we'll see, can be helpful, but you have a victory point loss for each use. Right? Sequence of play. Uh, weather plays a big role. Um, we'll see that here over here in a second. So every turn you roll for weather, and then the UN player turn, escalation phase. And it notice it says, may attempt to escalate the conflict. 
unlike NATO 61, you could just do it. And here, this is it. Um, this is the escalation ladder. And the number in parens is the number you have to roll or higher. We'll confirm that when we get there. So you can see, as long as you don't roll a 1, you can get to police action. And in real life, that's as far as it got here. But then maybe you can go to limited war. And you can start using atomic bombs. Um, the scope still hasn't changed. Well, now it includes North Korea. USSR can be mobilized. Um, and then Asian war. Uh, what comes into play now is you can attack mainland China. You can attack Taiwan or Formosa. Uh, and then the Soviet Union can be involved. This is the scope. And then if for whatever reason you escalate to global war, got to roll a 5 or 6 for that. Uh, everybody's involved, and you'll see we'll have conflict now, and we'll be rolling for conflicts in these different areas. Yeah, here you go. You see, here's the, uh, when we escalate to China, there's an invasion of mainland China by the U.S., uh, invasion of Formosa by the communist player, and if we do escalate to European conflict, uh, we end up using this table to resolve the status of the conflict each turn. So that's actually the unique components. Um, just like NATO 1961. Again, escalation is not promised. you got to roll to see if you can do it. Then the air phase. UN player collects air points to be used during the communist turn. And <coughs> here's where the air points are. and You see they're totally tied to the escalation point. Um, there are no communist air points. We're assuming air superiority for the UN. And depending on the level of the war, that determines how many of the air points they get. <laughs> so, and then we got the reinforcement phase, uh, re replacement points, and mobilizing the National Guard for the UN. I'll show you the strategic map. Hey, well, here we go. And there is a strategic map in this game. And you already three see here, um, we're at the incident level right now. In the Far East, the U.S. has five divisions, and they've got that yellow. Interestingly enough, these units are not at full strength. They start the game at partial strength. And then in Formosa, uh, here, this is the Taiwanese or Nationalist Chinese units, which can potentially come into play. Here's the Seventh Fleet. <coughs> then we've got <coughs> Marine units. I apologize. Every time I record, I start doing this. <clears throat> Maybe it's psychological. So, these units can pretty much come into play right away. You, you pay victory points for them, even at the incident level. These kind of represent the units that were rushed to Korea to stave off a North Korean overrun of the entire peninsula before it can be stopped. And then if you <clears throat> move up the escalation ladder, these potentially become available you see the 82nd and 11th Airborne. You also see um, <coughs> the 3rd and 4th Infantry and the 2nd Armored. 1st Infantry is stationed in Europe, so it's going to stay there probably. So potentially, you could bring in both Marine Corps units. If you escalated, you could bring these units in. But from the beginning, <coughs> we're going to see it's the uh, Far East units. And each turn, the strategic movement, you can move these. Um, you see that the U.S. units are going to be moving by C, the green here. Um, and then you see by land, communist units can move. And this is where we get in the mobilization. Uh, the U.S., beyond what's on the board here, has four National Guard units that can be mobilized <coughs> at a higher escalation level. And they start here. So they would have to be transported. <coughs> I need a glass of water. They would have to be transported um, to get through here. Okay. And the same USSR, they appear in Siberia. So you do see they enter the board by being transported. Chinese units. There are a lot of Chinese units that don't start on the board. 
and they would have to start here and be transported in and then we have UN uh, replacements that come in <coughs> so there is a strategic uh, d dimension here tied to the escalation right and then we do off-board conflicts if it's escalated to that point uh, nationals China mainland China Europe and then we get to the movement phase and here we have <laughs> an atomic attack phase if it's escalated a uh, UN unit can spend victory points and um, drop atomic bombs uh, we'll see their effectiveness a little later combat phase and then end phase and the players can uh, interesting here this is where you can potentially end the game they can agree to both end the game and then we calculate victory points or the game could be in a stalemate phase where kind of like in real life it kind of just bogged down here on the DMZ so the UN player in this case or the communist player could challenge his opponent to a stalemate which basically says if the, if the uh, opponent takes the challenge uh, they need to do something in the next two turns get a victory point hex which are cities and ports or even escalate otherwise if they don't at the end of the two turns the game is over uh, called a stalemate which is what happened in real life now we see the communist player escalation reinforcement strategic movement similar uh, offboard conflict movement phase so we're always rolling every turn if there's offboard conflicts rolling every turn to see if it changes they have a limited amount of atomic weapons uh, we'll see that atomic weapons are air delivered and if the bombers are shot down there's a chance in the US in the UN point of view that you know as they're <coughs> trying to bomb communist targets if they get shot down uh, the communists can try and recover the, the atomic bomb and add it to their arsenal and again another end phase here okay so just cutting to the chase here um, weather clear overcast rain snow and bitter which have different effects here uh, affects both air points available airborne and amphibious operations movement and combat okay um, air operations hampered by cloud cover overcast and bitter months US air points reduced by one rain and snow is halved uh, we'll see there's airborne and amphibious operations we can do airborne only on clear turns amphibious on clear or overcast and that effects of movement um, rain all units is halved let's see what we had thus on rain the movement allowance of all units are halved and on snow and bitter they're reduced by two and then during bitter months real cold uh, plus one die roll monitor period to everybody okay and we do see those summarized here weather effects clear no effect overcast minus one air point no airborne rain well all these no airborne no amphib and we see down here at bitter plus one so and we also have our weather table and the weather varies for each month the results can vary too okay so weather does definitely play a role here like it did in real life <coughs> escalation and we kind of touched it two components to the escalation ladder uh, we saw where they can they have an escalation phase where they can try to escalate and if we look at that the scope is first when we're in the incident phase the only victory points that count are the ones in South Korea that's the scope of the battle when we go to police action same token victory points South Korea if we can get to limited war then these in North Korea count depending on who's taking them okay and then if we escalate all the way to Asian war well then we're talking about you know cities major these are major cities and minor cities two VPs one VP uh, in the now we're talking Soviet Union Formosa Red China North Korea South Korea and if somehow you get to global war well now we're gonna see victory points for uh, in Europe and we'll see there's Berlin victory points Paris victory points um, Shanghai and uh, I forgot the name Taipei I think it is for Taiwan so there's victory points for that you know if you're conflicting there 
So if it does escalate, you know, that's a concern. But up to limited war, well, police action is South Korea only. And this is kind of similar to NATO 1961. Initially, the scope, I think, starts out with just Berlin, and then it extends to East Germany if the uh, NATO tries to, you know, do a rescue convoy. And then when it goes to general war, the scope applies to everybody. So, and that's all spelled out here, too. Um, yeah, and there's the scope, and we do see the air points and replacement. Oh, yeah, even replacement rights. Um, let's see where it lists that. Yeah, these are replacements. One, the asterisk means if they hold their own capital, they get two. Um, same thing here. And, you know, we get to police action now. There are UN units. Um, we've got some Brits. We've got some Canadians. We've got some Turks. So that's their UN. And then the U.S. get one replacement point. And we see when we go to limited war, it goes up to two. It does change, and then you see higher and higher. So scope, replacement points, and air points, and the cost to mobilize stuff. And we see if we're an incident level, two VPs to mobilize one Far East U.S. division. And then when we get to police action, it doesn't cost as many, one VP. But I can start now pulling from the U.S., but that'll cost two VPs one for UN. And PLA is interesting. They they come in as whole armies. They're the only ones. See how the you have division um, designation to the right, but the army designation to the left. So one per PLA army. So if I mobilize uh, one VP PLA, I get those three divisions for that army. I mean, these start on board, but there will be other ones. Okay. This is interesting. We'll talk about that later. So I think we've covered escalation, but we'll see how it plays. Uh, escalation restrictions. No, this is this is the kicker here. I found very interesting. Um, to escalate, you have to request it, and then you have to roll. Uh, consult the number printed on the desire and roll a die. If the roll is greater than or equal to the printed number, it's approved. Roll is less than. It is denied, and the current level is maintained. Okay, but there's a penalty here. So if I want a police action, I've got to roll a 2 to 6. If I want a limited war, i got to roll a 3 to 6. If I want an Asian war, 4 to 6. Um, you could say, well, I'll just keep trying, and then I'll get it. No, what actually happens is, um, if a player fla fails at the escalation roll, cannot escalate a game for the remainder of the game, unless the opponent does it. Okay? But the player does have a choice to put everything on the die, and say, I'm going to ignore that denial and attempt to do it again. Um, and then they may succeed, and they're okay. But if they don't succeed the second time, the game's over. They're fired. In case of MacArthur, he flies to Hawaii, meets Truman, and he's fired. Um, and that's what uh, MacArthur tried to do. He kept trying to escalate. So that puts a little bit of penalty here on, you know, you're not going to freely escalate. you got to think about it. Yeah, historically, MacArthur got fired when he publicly announced a desire to attack China to turn the war into Asian war in defiance of the president, and he got fired. So this is what uh, MacArthur was going for, expanding the scope from here. See, the scope still here is South and North Korea. USSR, Formosa, mainland China, still off the table, and of course Europe. And this is MacArthur wanted to go here. And Truman said, request denied, you're fired. And Ridgeway came in. Um, air power, we saw that. Two things I can use it for, interdiction, cover briefly. Uh, roll against an interdiction table, and that's how many, um, and it's the U.S. player's choice. They can put uh, communist units out of supply, having both combat and movement. Co communists do have a way to... If they put two other units out of supply, they can put the other one back in supply. goes back and forth. This one I found interesting. Um, MacArthur wanted to just start dropping radioactive waste, creating a no-man's land. Okay. Um, you can do that, uh, I guess, here. Uh, UN player may substitute. Yeah, we can put in lay of an out of supply for interdiction here. And the effect of a radioactive hex 
is nobody can move into it and supplies can't go through it. And if you drop them on a unit there, they have to retreat. And if they can't, <coughs> um, let's see if they can't retreat. Yeah, unit caught in a hex where radioactive lace must me immediately retreat from the affected hex. Multiple retreats if the unit is surrounded by several hexes of freshly laid wealth waste. Well, that's interesting. And then the traditional use shifts the odds on a combat, both for attack and defense. Offensively and defensively, they can assist airborne and defensious assaults. Maximum one air point shift. Okay. Uh, replacement, we saw that. Replacement points. <coughs> they cannot be saved from turn to turn, so use it or lose it. One point will bring a unit to full strength. Two points will recover a destroyed unit. And this tells you where they appear. Siberia, Korea. This is replacement now on that reinforcements. Uh, and there's the additional point for having your your capital. And we'll see when we talk about atomic weapons, we can literally target the hex, destroy the, the railway, destroy the port, etc. And you can use replacement points instead to rebuild that. Um, also. Uh, then there's this mobilization. Some units need to be mobilized. Chinese, Soviet units that are not at start, and the U.S. National Guard. Um, and when they're mobilized, we saw on the strategic map where they're placed. And it costs that. Strategic movement. Color-coded, we saw that. Um, during the strategic movement phase, the player may conduct one of the following actions move on the strategic display from one area to an adjacent area, move by land to or from the strategic map, back and forth between the map, embark and debark between ports, conduct uh, airborne and amphibious assaults. So we'll look at that when we get into the game. Sea movement. Uh, this is mainly the UN player. And you can actually, the unit that embarks on a turn can land on the same turn at another port on the map. So U.S. Division in the strategic movement phase in Busan can embark and then go to the Korea area or land at any other port on the map in that phase. So that could assist with an invasion. And there is an emergency evacuation for the U.N. 7th Fleet has to be around to pull that off. Airborne and amphibious landings. Um, airborne units, undestroyed city or the Korea area. Only clear weather. Uh, they don't have Zoc. They can land on enemy units. Amphibious assault. Seventh Fleet must be present. And you can do it into enemy units. But if you do, t you know, and if you succeed and it's got a port hex, you can then immediately, here we go, um, may immediately strategically move units into that port hex. So you could invade with the Marines, take the port at Probably Inchon, for example, seems to be an invasion place here. And then you see they can bring in the, you know, there's a 4 6, they push the KPA out, 7th Division comes in, so you can coordinate that. Soviets have rail movement, unlimited distance through connected rail hexes. 7th uh, Fleet, we kind of talked about what it can do. One more thing it can do. We saw it for amphibious landings and assaults, emergency evacuations. It can do naval bombardment. The counter is placed on the map on any coastal hex. It can support any battles, overruns uh, in the hex or adjacent to the hex it occupies. One column shift. Okay, pretty standard. Offboard conflicts. Uh, we kind of touched on this. Formosa and China. Asian war escalation. Uh, this is a procedure. Uh, when the invasion starts, it's one or the other. So whoever does one first, you can't do the other. So if the Chinese quickly jump and say we're invading Formosa, well, now um, the UN can't try and, you know, attack Communist China until that has been resolved. Um, actually, if you succeed in one or the other, then that's it too, because it kind of represents either the national Chinese falling or a revolution in Communist China. Shanghai and Taipei, you get victory points for those if you get them. And this is however this plays out. Every turn you roll against the conflict tables 
and see the outcomes here. And we do see down here invasion repulse. You can assign units. All invading troops are eliminated. All victorious troops suffer one step loss. Counter revolution triggered in China. Nationalists overthrown. The communists of Delius. You see, it's one of the other. Et cetera. And then Europe, um, Berlin, and Paris potentially. It's on the charts when you resolve it, but there are victory points for that. And if somebody wins in Europe, the game is over. Thus, if a victory result is achieved on the European conflict table, the game ends, and the victorious player automatically wins, regardless of what's going on. So be careful. Um, movement, pretty standard. Terra can't move into radioactive hexes, and there is a, a terrain effects chart, as expected. And it does, um, where was that? Not very good with this wheel. Terrain effects. Clear one, rough two MP with a shift. Mountain, two shift with a three. Can't go in water. Major city, plus two DRM, two VP. City, plus one to the die roll, one VP. Port symbols, one VP. Uh, a river, if you're attacking across it, one half, plus one to cross. Uh, pretty standard. Um, you can do overruns, uh, move into the hex, paying double movement cost, other zones of controls are ignored. Uh, Comet resolved at half strength though, attacking units at half strength, terrain effects apply. Uh, if the attackers do, they retreat back to the hex they started from. Defending units must retreat to one of the three hexes opposite. Any units that can't uh, suffer an additional step loss. Road movement. Interesting here. Um, all UN and Soviet units may conduct road movement. Chinese and North Koreans can't. Uh, they can use the rails, though. And there are no roads on the map. It just assumes roads are everywhere. And a unit conducting road movement pays one movement point regardless of the terrain. So looking over here... You can see that these are all rough hexes, but a UN unit would only pay one MP because it's assumed there's roads in there they can use, as opposed to the North Koreans who would have to pay for it. They only get, uh, well, they get unlimited movement on an unbroken rail line. Stacking, four divisions. Okay, this is interesting. Zones of control. Uh, in some sense, it's standard. Uh, but you got to understand the distinction between a contested and an uncontested zone of control. <coughs> uncontested zone of control means, you know, six hexes surrounding a unit. Um, uncontested zone of control means that this unit must stop upon entering the hex. Okay. Next turn it can move out. You can't go zock to zock. Pretty standard, but you can move in and out. Okay. Also, an uncontested zock blocks supply. But the difference is a Contested Zoc, that's what these two hexes are. And if this guy was here, okay, these two um, supply could be traced through here, but the, the unique dimension is this also becomes contested for movement, meaning any unit now doesn't have to stop. So because this unit contests this guy's Zoc, this one can move here and then he can move there. Now he's got to stop because he's an uncontested Zoc. So um, lines can be infiltrated, I guess you'd call it. That's the unique thing there. Contested and uncontested Zoc. And when it is contested as Zoc, it doesn't stop other units from moving through it. And we see this. Presence of a friendly unit negating all enemy Zoc. Um, units may freely trace supplies and move through a contested enemy Zoc. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's, it just makes that important. You can get through the line. Supply, determined at the moment of movement and the moment of combat. Unit without a supply line is considered out of supply. Can't trace them through prohibited hexes. Hexes containing enemy ground units. Hexes containing uncontested uh, Zox and a radioactive hex. Uh, can go through atomic bomb mushroom clouds. 
and units on strat to sell are always in supply. And then we have the uh, supply sources, KPRRK unoccupied, city hexes within, I think that just means controlled by them. PLA, city hexes within China, or the map edge, UN and US go to ports, UN, US, and nationalist China. And the USSR goes to Vladivostok or any map edge um, in the Soviet Union here, so I would assume here. Uh, let's see. So North Korea may use Soviet and Chinese supply sources once it escalates to limited war. Airborne Marines are in supply. Supplies checked at the moment a unit begins to move and have their movement allowance halved. Uh, combat purse supplies checked both at attacking and defending unit at the moment of revolution. Combat strength halved. Retain fractions. I guess we'll need a calculator. All right, what can an atomic bomb do? Um, I will keep going. We're only at 31 minutes. We're good. Uh, these are not as powerful as we saw in NATO 1961. Uh, collateral damage, fallout result, there will be a table for that. They're air delivered in 1950 and 51. There are no ICBMs, IRBMs, or SSBNs, or SSBs. They all have to be dropped by bombers. Uh, A-bombs also cause collateral damage. I think there's a collateral damage table here. Here it is. On map strategic display. Uh, I think that's the number of victory points here. Um, yeah, atomic bombs have no effect on any other targets within the hex. Okay, so we'll see what we can target. Uh, basically, you can target uh, units. We'll see that in combat, or we can target. Um, facilities. Ports, okay, atomic bombs, homeland targets can be dropped on ports, rails, and or cities. Such an action immediately destroys the target, permanently removing any functional purpose, nullifying any die roll modifiers, and victory point calculations they drop from. So if an atomic bomb was dropped here, this port would no longer function. These rails would be broken, this rail line, and there would be no victory points for either side for this, okay? And it just takes one atomic bomb. It doesn't do anything beyond that. And then they talk about this, the port, etc. are gone. Um, strategic bombing can be conducted off-map China when we get to Asian or global. And strategic bombing of the Soviet Union can be talked in global war. Uh, causing massive collateral damage. Keep track of the number of A-bombs dropped strategically on a separate one, and you go through that collateral damage. Here's an option rule that I was mentioning. Um, potentially the communists can shoot down the bombers and potentially recover the atomic bomb and use it in their um, area. And here's the one where we can use replacement points to rebuild a port and rails in a hex. So replacement points could be used to rebuild this hex if it was atomic bombed. So some use here. We'll see the use against combat units in a second. Uh, and we get to combat here. Attacks are voluntary, not mandatory. Don't have to announce them beforehand. Can wait on the results, the standards uh, stuff here. Multi-unit, multi-hex. Um, Standard combat ratios, terrain effects. We did see them on the terrain effects chart. Um, and then we come down to combat results. Pretty much straightforward. Attacker eliminated. Retreat one hex. Defender retreat one hex. Um, some kind of unique ones. Partial exchange. All defending units suffer one step loss. The attacker loses an equal number of steps. Most units here do have a flip side. Okay. And then a standard exchange, a side with fewer steps, look, we're looking at steps now, is eliminated, and uh, the other side has to man it, match. <coughs> Defender mauled. All defending units uh, suffer one step loss and retreat one hex. It's a little bit short of a full DE, standard DE. Um, retreat. Units in a stack may retreat to different hexes. 
Um, can't retreat into radioactive waste. Any units that cannot follow the above retreat conditions suffer a step loss and remain in the hex. So if you surrounded a unit and it can't retreat, it suffers a step loss. It's not automatically eliminated. Uh, can retreat into overstack situations, but the stacking must be met. Players can kind of do a cascade effect and retreat units from the overstack that weren't, you know, that were originally there, retreat them out. Uh, can't retreat, though, more than one hex for each unit, so you cause multiple cascades. Stacking, though, is four divisions. Um, yeah, advance after combat, you can advance after combat. Okay, this is important here, surprise. During the first two turns, the first two months of the game, KPA receives combat shifts. Uh, two for June and one for July for each battle. When attacking, the odds are shifted to the right. When defending, shifted to the left. So that applies both to attacking and defending. Two in June and then one in July, I think it is, yeah. And then the surprise wears off. Chinese, when they're in the game, can declare they're doing a wave attack. And on the first turn, they use wave attack, shifted two to the right. And then any turns following, for the rest of the game, one to the right. But there is a penalty. Uh, automatically incurs a number of step losses equal to the number of defending steps. So if I was attacking three UN steps and I did a wave attack, I would have to lose three steps to get the combat shift. So is it worth it? Don't know. Okay, guerrillas. Um, this is where actually North Korean units disband and act as guerrillas. After the Inshan landing, many combat units disbanded, blended into the countryside. These units appeared months later in the UN's rear areas. Oops. This is kind of a problem here. You can disband them as guerrillas, and later on they can come back and you can place a guerrilla counter, which can't move, can't really do anything. It's just got, it, it has the Zoc effect in its hex, so it forces the UN to go back and get rid of it. And a maximum of six units may be disbanded over the course of the game. And loses one VP for every KPEA unit that disbands in South Korea during 1950. So file that away. Uh, game proceeds until automatic victory or a vic you know the European conflict. If one side or the other wins Europe, it's over. Um, or an automatic victory. And an automatic victory is you eliminate all opposing units within the current scope, and that's important. If in the incident scope, if all South Korean units or all UN units can be eliminated out of South Korea or even in the police action, then that's an automatic victory. Once you get to limited war, now you've got to eliminate your opponent in both of these. And then here it it becomes a little harder. Um, so that's one way. Victory in Europe is the other way. And then the stalemate challenge. Beginning in 51, stalemate challenges, player channels his opponent. Um, Challenging player must gain at least one victory point in the next two turns. Okay, and it could be through escalation. Went too far. Players eliminated one stalemate challenge each game year. Okay, so use it wisely. And then victory points. Uh, victory points are awarded cities and ports within the scope and last unit to move through it. The UN player loses one VP for every KPA unit that disbands we saw. Victory points can also be gained from off-board conflicts. Uh, you lost during escalatory that stuff. These losses subtract from the total number of objectives captured. Uh, and then the collateral damage of atomic bombs. That's yeah it is victory points. For each A-bomb dropped within a region, uh, the communist and UN players lose a printed number of victory points. That's why you keep track of the, how many atomic bombs you've used. Uh, you can end at negative victory points, and 
that could just mean you lose. So, June 25th scenario, this is the historical start. Um, players set up their units, and it's just a spe units that have yellow in their indicator, and those are set up units. That's why we have a few here. These all have yellow. And if you look on the strategic, you see these all have yellow in them. There are a lot of Chinese that don't have yellow. There's some USSRs that don't have the National Guard for the U.S. Um, basically units that have to be mobilized and pay victory points. Uh, special rules. This is uh, actually sets the tone for this first scenario. Uh, we only have a half turn on June, the first turn. Game begins with a communist player turn. And two turns are special rules. Uh, June 1950, it's only communist player turn. Weather is automatically clear. This is a big one here. No escalation. Okay. So for June 50, well, the UN doesn't have anything. You know, they don't even have a phase. No UN air points. And the KPA surprise for two column shift. So that's June 50. But you'll see July again, no escalation. So the UN can't escalate until August. And still one shift for that. So that gives potentially the North Koreans, I don't know if they can pull it off, they got two turns where um, there is no escalation, which means the most the U.S. can do, they'll get one U.S. air point in the July turn, um, and they'll have to pay a lot of victory points to mobilize reduced strength Far East units. They'll have to pay a victory point to use 7th Fleet, and they actually they only get one air point, and if they use it, they have to do a victory point. So it sounds like it's in the UN's advantage once you get to August to attempt to escalate here to police action. But during those two months, which is kind of like real life, the North Koreans, they have a chance uh, in real life. The Pusan perimeter barely held on. And then MacArthur came in and did the end run around Incheon. So those special rules definitely apply. Uh, there is another scenario in November uh, when the Chinese start flooding across the border, following units placed historically. Um, all remaining U.S. units set up according to initial deployment, remaining rock, are destroyed and are available to be rebuilt. Um, communists, this is, and this is how they get in the game, basically. Um, they don't start in China. They start 1508. Looks like they start right on the board. I would guess. Actually, I haven't looked at this. This is a good question. Uh, where's my zoom? There it is. So we've got starting hexes of 1712. Yeah, that's right there. Uh, and that's actually true. Chinese units, if I understand history right, before they actually attacked, they were busy infiltrating in. So all of these units have infiltrated in. So this will pick up um, right when the Chinese units reveal themselves and attack. Um, six guerrilla units. Uh, remaining KPA are destroyed, available to rebuilt. And special rules, it starts with the communist combat phase. And bitter, so the DRM modifier is there. And the escalation level is limited war. And both sides are at zero VPs. Okay. And the Chinese can do the wave attacks. First turn they do it, two shift. Every turn after that, a one shift per step. So you could uh, recreate that initial Chinese assault with that one. Um, designer notes. Uh, Kerry talks about how um, there's a lot of great Korean War games out there, but uh, his goal was to simulate the broader context, the Cold War, the potential for escalation, like he did in NATO 1961. So here's the trouble, you know, this and it, that escalation is what adds complexity in decisions. Not necessarily complexity in the rules, but the number of decisions you have. I mean, I saw that with NATO 1961. While I had an understanding of the rules and the effects, I mean, how it played out and the decisions you have to make um, really change things. 
and also potentially it it makes no two games the same so looking forward to uh, playing through this uh, this was yeah like I said this was my introduction overview of the rules uh, as I go through the game though I'll make sure that I'm doing the rules correctly and and we'll see if this is any different um, yeah this is where we ended they were at limited war when China attacked so there was South and North Korea victory points um, this is in I'll have to look at this I mean looks like you can drop atomic bombs but just on North Korea yeah MacArthur wanted to escalate to mainland China and that's where he ran into uh, MacArthur unfortunately uh, rolled twice under a one two or three so rolling twice one two or three uh, Truman fired him that's how the game would play that out um, so can you win in limited war can you get to limited war who knows so this is the added dimension here and here's your collateral damage per atomic bomb um, at the end victory point calculation all right so my intent with the next video will be I'll have set up the units here and uh, the North Koreans have two turns to go with their combat shifts um, limited UN intervention so We'll see how far they get uh, and if they in the two months conceivably if they eliminate all the um, Republic of Korean units and any UN units or US Far East units that happen to get on the board uh, the game could be over um, because that's the scope <laughs> but then the US can go to police action get more reinforcements try and stay on the board um, and then at some point it may go to limited war and the communist player can do this kind of stuff too I don't think the communist player is incident <coughs> interested in escalating from incident police action <coughs> but once you're at police action uh, the communist player may be interested in escalating limited war to bring uh, the Chinese into play although it looks like they can do it here so we'll sort this out so that's uh, relatively quick overview of the game of 50 minutes that was kind of long so I'm gonna end it here apologize for the coughing at the beginning it seems to have <coughs> well now that I bring it up I start it so I'll try and do better in future recording so in the next recording we will be starting MacArthur's war with the North Korean invasion of South Korea in June of 1950 Thank you for listening.